Hello again. This is Daniel Peterson from Mississippi State. Um, I'm now going to present my second seminar of the day. Uh, this is seminars entitled Old and New Physical Mapping Techniques and Their Application to Conifer Genome Research. The concept of mapping has been around for a long time. Uh, the earliest maps were probably very simple and were used to help guide people um, from one place to another. In this um, very poorly drawn example, um, we have a starting place, my cave, and a destination, Grug's Cave. And then there are landmarks, a, a big tree and a rock, and a warning um, not to go the way in which there's the bad snake and the troll. So essentially this is a very simplistic map, but this is probably the first kind of maps that existed. Over time, maps became much more complex in the, and more detailed in the features they contain. Maps are ultimately simplified representations of more complex things. Uh, they serve as starting places for new adventures and um, provide landmarks from which we can stray from the path but not necessarily get lost. All maps can be improved. Um, they may start out very crude actually. If you look at the top right uh, figure, it is a map from around 600 BC. Um, it is at that point, they, there were three continents that, they, that were identified, Asia, Europe, and Libya. And you can see the Mediterranean and Black Sea between them. Um, clearly, this map is, uh, needed more information to be more informative. And if you look at the map below it, you see um, a map from 1570. Uh, this has got most of the continents in the world on it. Um, the shapes of the continents are rather odd, especially, for example, South America, but um, at least most of the pieces are there, although I don't believe there is that Australia is found on this map. Um, and then below that is a map from essentially modern day, um, and you can see the, the refinement and the, the map becomes more useful as as it becomes more refined. But one important thing about maps is that they are they can be worthless if they have too much detail on them. They don't um, they need to be to have just enough data on them and that they can serve as a tractable guide and that they can be used for comparison and as I said to guide in, you in new adventures. At the start of the 20th century, there was a very famous geneticist by the name of Thomas Hunt Morgan, who using fruit flies demonstrated the um, concept of genetic linkage, specifically that, that genes lie along chromosomes in a, in a regular order, um, in a conserved order. And that crossing over, um, which had already been described, um, can occur between genes, and that essentially the closer that genes are on a chromosome, um, the less likely there is to be genetic uh, recombination between them. So Morgan turned to his, uh, to his student, Alfred Sturdevant, who at that time was an undergraduate, and said, okay, we've got this, this idea, um, why don't you figure out how to make a map out of this stuff? So Studevant took him up on that, um, on that challenge and went home and that night figured out a, a means of creating maps of genes based upon the recombination between those genes. And um, this is the basic of, basis of genetic mapping or linkage mapping that um, is still used widely today. Shown at the right is a, uh, a fairly typical genetic linkage map, and it essentially shows a series of markers um, which represent genes or, or low copy sequences and their relationship in terms of their um, order along a chromosome. Genetic linkage mapping is, is wonderful in that it does 
provide information on the order of markers along chromosomes. And it also gives us some idea about how close markers are to each other. Closely linked markers have very little recombination between them, while markers that are very distant from each other on the same chromosome have larger recombination distances between, between each other. However, linkage maps have some weaknesses. Primarily, um, linkage distance has nothing to do with actual physical distance, or very little to do with it. For example, you can have two genes that are very closely linked, but that may be separated by, by millions or billions of base pairs. In particular, you may have two genes that are separated by a huge heterochromatin, heterochromatic segment of, of, of chromosome where there is very little recombination. So the linkage map will, map will suggest that they, those two genes are right next to each other, where really they may be quite far apart from each other. Okay, so we've discussed genetic mapping, and now I'd like to talk about physical mapping. Physical mapping has really two definitions, depending on who you talk to. One is the identification of relatively large pieces of partially overlapping DNA that collectively span a chromosome or part of a chromosome. And this usually includes determination of the nucleotide distances between genes and markers. Unlike uh, genetic mapping, where you only get recombination distances between markers, uh, physical mapping actually gives you a, at least a rough estimate of nucleotide distances. A second definition of physical mapping is the visual visualization of the positions of genes on chromosomes. There are four types of physical mapping that I'm going to talk about today. The first type I will call DNA clone-based physical mapping. The second type I'll call concomitant physical mapping and genome sequencing. The third I'll refer to as optical mapping. And the fourth is fluorescence in situ hybridization or fish-based mapping, mapping, also known as cytomolecular mapping. DNA clone-based physical mapping is based upon the grouping of clones into contigs. A contig is a set of clones containing partially overlapping pieces of insert DNA that collectively represent an uninterrupted stretch of genomic DNA. Contigs are then grouped into scaffold, scaffolds, um, and the goal of most clone-based physical mapping research is to produce scaffolds that represent entire chromosomes. Um, in other words, where you have one scaffold or contig per chromosome. And then sequencing of a chromosome-length scaffold or contig gives you the sequence of that chromosome. You've likely heard me already use the term BACS, which is an acronym for Bacterial Artificial Chromosomes. BACS um, are modified F factors. These are the fertility plasmids found in um, E. coli. The BAC vectors can carry inserts of 100 kb to about 400 kb. Of particular note, they have specialized genes called partitioning genes, which prevent more than one back from being in the cell at a time. So this is very important because recombination between more than one clone or one, more than one vector in a cell can cause all kinds of problems. Uh, there are other types of, of vectors that are also used, including phosmids and P1 derived artificial chromosomes or PACs, and originally yeast artificial chromosomes were used. Um, these are called YAKs. YAKs fell out of favor early on in the Human pro Genome Project because while they could hold um, a million base pair inserts, uh, they also underwent lots of recombination and created a lot of chimeric molecules that didn't really occur in the, in the human genome. So ultimately, at this point, BACs are, are the uh, vector of choice for doing any type of physical mapping that involves um, clones. So back about 2004, I, got a, I received a grant from the National Science Foundation to build some resources for uh, 
loblolly pine, some genomic resources. And one of the big goals of that project was to construct a back library uh, for loblolly pine. Because loblolly pine has a genome seven times larger than human, uh, this library was going to be pretty big. Um, essentially, we ended up with a library that has oh, about 7x coverage of the genome, the pine genome, and contains about 1.7 million, 1.7 million clones individually archived in 384 well plates. In order to do this, we utilized a robot. Uh, a picture is shown of this robot on the, on the left, and it has these little needles that it fires down into um, a agarose plate on which clones have been plated. Um, it picks the white colonies um, which contain backs with pieces of pine insert DNA in them and then it goes the head with all the pins goes over and inoculates media in the wells of, of one of the 384 well plates and this process rep is repeated for plate after plate until you get a whole library in which you've got uh, many many different clones um, and they're all in, um, in an ordered fashion. Well, what do you do when you get a back library? One of the first things that people often do is, is take those back clones and digest them with, with a series of restriction enzymes, then run them out on a agarose or more recently acrylamide gels to get high resolution um, DNA fingerprints. And what you can then do is you can start using um, all kinds of automated tools to compare fingerprints between backs and thus find backs that, over, or that are partially overlapping. So this is part of the contig building process. Another important thing that you can do with the backs is that each back is, is uh, includes a vector with the insert in a circular form and the sequences of the vector itself are known so you can design primers that are similar to the ends of uh, the vector right next to the insert on each end and you can you can use uh, Sanger sequencing to produce what they call back end sequences or the, the parts of the insert that are adjacent to the to the ends of the back um, you can also, when you t by running the the uh, uh, linearized back on a, a pulse field gel electrophoresis system, you can determine the size of the back clone and thus the size of the insert. So you can get an idea of the distance between the back end sequences. Okay, so what happens next? Well, typically. The back libraries are gridded onto high-density nylon macroarrays, and these are just sheets of nylon that are square, uh, roughly 22 by 22 centimeters. Um, the macroarrays are probed with molecular genetic markers, including RFLPs or also cDNAs, and the backs recognized by each probe are determined. Now because the libraries are ordered in a very specific way and in plates and, and what each well has a, a letter and a numerical designation you can actually map the uh, a back that is hybridized to a probe you can map that back to the plate that it where it's located. Uh, another thing is the back end sequences are, that are, are used to design a ligand oligonucleotide probes that are then used to screen the macroarrays and find partially overlapping clones. So macroarrays are a means of screening a, a very large um, back library. I show a, a kind of stylized image of a, of a macroarray. Normally you don't see a bunch of little spots on it, but this is a macroarray that has about 26,000 individual spots on it. Um, the macroarray is divided into fields and each field is divided into a bunch of little grids and, and each clone is actually stamped onto uh, within one of the little grids it is found twice and in, 
in a very specific um, arrangement to its its complement. Um, you can make arrays even denser than than um, that have even more than twenty six thousand clones on them, but generally eighteen thousand to twenty six thousand is, is typical. Um, once the clones are spotted onto them, the the membranes are placed onto an auger surface with the medium containing medium with the spots facing up and you essentially um, produce a bunch of little colonies that are then fixed to the membrane. Um, the agar medium supplies bacteria with the nutrients that it needs to to grow and then once they're fixed then you can screen them with probes. In general it is inefficient to probe a set of macro arrays with just one probe at a time. Um, you've got to think of all the data that exists on one one macro array. You literally have twenty, say, twenty five thousand clones, and it's if you just screen one probe at a time, that's a lot of hybridizations. Also, typically because there are not enough different colored fluorescent dyes to differentially label more than a handful of probes, most of the time uh, hybridization is carried out using radio labeled probes. And so this is the, the most cost-effective way of, of dealing with this. So strategies have been developed to uh, um, allow multiple probes to be used at one time and then deconvolute um, the probes after hybridization. You have to be very careful, though, in what probes that you utilize because if you utilize a probe that contains a repetitive sequence, you may light up almost every back upon the macro array. And shown here below is, is, is a close-up of a macro array in which we actually purposely probed this macro array with a repeat sequence and then determined the, um, the, the estimated the number of this repeat sequence in the genome. But you can see that if you if you were to use repetitive DNAs, you'd get real problems because almost everything would light up. So for probes, you want to use single copy sequences, or at least those that are found in fairly low copy numbers. The image below shows a two-dimensional multiplexing strategy for for pooling rows and or columns to um, to more efficiently probe macro arrays. I won't go into any details on this, but it is one of the, the techniques used to um, increase the, the utility of the macro arrays by probing them with multiple probes and then deconvoluting the information later. This image shows a, an actual macro array that's been probed with um, a number of backs. Um, each back appears as two little dots in close association with each other. So for example in field number two up at the top you see one little double dot um, which represents one positive back clone. In field six you see one, two, three, possibly four uh, positive clones uh, and so on. Um, using the, the complex deconvoluting strategies you can actually determine the clone, which clone um, is represented by a, a pair of double dots and go back to that clone in the, the library, find its plate, uh, find the well uh, that it comes from. So now we have a lot of information. We have the um, probe hybridization information, we have our DNA fingerprints, we have back-end data, we have genetic maps as well, and so one of the what we do with this information is we use com computational methods and relational databases to integrate this together to produce contigs, um, which are sets of partially overlapping back clones. So when we analyze the data, we look for backs recognized by the same probe, backs that have partial fingerprints in common and backs that are recognized via macroarray hybridization by the same probes or back-end sequences. And then through this we are able to 
essentially construct the contigs. Contigs are merged as appropriate and assembled into scaffolds, which includes both the contigs and the gaps. And then the gaps are eventually closed using a variety of techniques, including chromosome walking, PCR amplification, uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization, etc. So clone-based physical mapping is a very complex procedure, and there are actually countless variations on it. Um, what the, the, the way that you approach it is kind of dictated by the skills that you have and the resources at your uh, disposal. For example, I, I was one who learned to utilize macro arrays, um, but some people are much more fond of utilizing PCR-based methods, and rather than screening macro arrays, macro arrays they will make pools of various um, back clones and then use marker-specific primers to identify positive clones. The following is a image is a, a highlight of a um, partial physical map of a region of sorghum of a sorghum chromosome. Um, this comes from some work that I was involved in when I was a postdoc in the end in the lab of Andrew Patterson at the University of Georgia. Uh, essentially, the Patterson lab did physical mapping of the sorghum genome, and that physical map was then used eventually in helping to sequence the genome of sorghum. You can see that each back is represented by a um, a line. Uh, the backs each have their their plate and well locations written above them. You can see how they overlap and the degree to which they overlap. Um, and then below that, it shows a, a molecular genetic map and the location of specific markers and the backs to which they hybridize as shown as dotted lines extending up from those markers. An important concept in physical mapping is that of the minimum tiling path. Um, this is the minimum, minimum number of overlapping backs that encompass an entire chromosome or chromosome region. As shown in the last picture, you can have lots of backs overlapping each other, but if you were just to pick the minimum number of, of backs that actually covered a region, it would be far fewer than, than what you saw in, say, the last image. Theoretically, the minimum, minimum tiling path for a genome consists of a collection of backs that completely represent the genome with as little overlap as possible. Um, in reality, you're never going to get, or using modern techniques, you're never going to get a map that does not have gaps in it. And this is in part due to the fact that uh, regions like centromeres are almost impossible to sequence and assemble correctly. Um, so anyway, you can, especially in the gene-rich regions of genomes, you can get physical maps that cover the gene-rich regions quite well. One thing that's very important to point out is that it's very advantageous to have very large insert sizes for the back clones. Um, the fewer clones, or the, the larger the insert size, the fewer clones you need to achieve a particular level of genome coverage. And likewise, the larger the inserts, the fewer clones that you will have to screen, fingerprint, and sequence and the fewer clones that you'll need to construct a minimum tiling path. So with regard to back clones, um, or any kind of clones using physical mapping, bigger is better. I got the blues, I got them old bad blues, yeah I got the blues.
music. Transformation was a ball, but pops feel chill electrophoresis says my insert size is small. I got the blues. I got them old bad blues. Consternation, deprivation, contamination. I got the old bad blues. So once you have a minimum tiling path, you can sequence that minimum tiling path and essentially get a, a genome sequence or something close to it. Originally, this was done by using capillary sequencing. And each back that was in that tiling, minimum tiling path would be sheared into pieces. The fragments would be subcloned, and then you'd have bidirectional and be bidirectionally sequenced. And then you'd put the whole thing together and you'd come up with a genome sequence. Genome sequence is generated from minimum, minimum tiling paths um, are the highest quality sequences currently available. Uh, the human genome, several of the plant genomes have been based upon minimum tiling paths. These are um, far and away the best sequences available because of the fact that the physical maps help position things correctly. However, Physical mapping, um, back-based physical mapping, is quite expensive, and it's also very time-consuming. It takes years to, to generate a physical map. It takes a lot of work, a lot of hybridization, um, a lot of resources. And that's why many people would rather avoid doing physical mapping. This brings us to a second but related type of physical mapping that I call concomitant physical mapping and genome sequencing. And this relies upon the fact that we have next generation or second generation sequencing technologies where you can sequence much more um, DNA than you used to be able to. Um, in this case, it utilizes ordered back libraries or, and or other large insert libraries as the sequencing substrate. So the starting material is um, an ordered library, a back library in which the, the plates or the clones are stored in numbered plates. The back DNA in a particular plate is then isolated um, so that each well contains the only the back found in, in that, the bacterial DNA and everything else is removed. Um, Each back and each well is then individually sheared um, into smaller pieces, usually by sonication or nebulization. It's important here, though, that, that the backs in one well don't get transferred over into another well. So the sonication is done um, to prevent cross-contamination. So now we have our sheared backs and Onto these backs, we want to add adapters that are compatible with the type of sequencing we're doing, for example, luminous sequencing. But additionally, we want the adapters to have some uh, a valuable thing called a barcode or an index, which allows us to discriminate between differently indexed backs. So essentially, tens to hundreds to thousands of adapters can be synthesized and they can be identical to the standard primer sequence that's used in say Illumina sequencing but each may have its own barcode or index and in the, in the images above I show the the purple um, part being the standard primer sequence and each of the colors being a short barcode associated with that particular adapter um, the barcodes are typically fairly short, usually between 3 to 20 base pairs long. Uh, the number of different barcodes you can generate is essentially 4 to the B power, where B is the length of the barcode. So, for example, if you have a, if you use 6 base pair barcodes, you can make 4,096 different barcodes. Um, so, anyway, these adapters with barcodes are, are generated. 
and then each different a different barcode is ligated onto the ends of the fragmented backs so each back gets a different barcode okay so once we have our sheared uh, individually barcoded back pieces we can pull backs from say all the backs in a plate or all the backs in, in a, a row or whatever we can pull them together and then run them on an Illumina sequencer essentially this gives us a bunch of reads each with the the standard um, uh, adapter sequence on it and then each with a barcode on it at this point computational techniques are used to separate out all the reads based upon barcode so all of the the reads with the GCG barcode are placed together, all the reads with the TAC barcode are placed together and so on. And these represent different reads um, from the same back. The, the barcode and the uh, adapter sequence are then removed and the uh, reads for a particular back are assembled into a consensus sequence. Each back sequence can then be aligned with other back sequences to form a contig, and contigs can be then merged together to build complete chromosome physical maps and concomitantly complete or nearly complete chromosome sequences. There are some limitations to this approach. One is that, that it is often difficult to develop and label every individual back with its own barcode. So oftentimes, um, whole plates of backs may be limit, may be labeled with a single barcode, and then pools of plates may be put together, or rows or or whatever. Another problem is that back cloning has some biases. Certain sequences may not be cloned in the in the process, and so these will be left out of any attempted assembly. A third type of physical mapping that I'm going to discuss is optical mapping. Optical mapping uh, literally involves the use of a fluorescence microscope um, and it is not necessarily a new technique but it's just recently seen um, a lot of interest in, in some commercial application of, of this technique. So the, the first paper that I'm aware of that where optical mapping was utilized was uh, this PNAS paper from 1998. There are a couple companies out there right now that are doing opti optical mapping commercially. Uh, one of these is BioNanogenomics. Another one is OpGen. They both have slightly different strategies. Um, we're actually, my lab's actually doing some work on cotton right now where we're doing physical mapping um, and we're collaborating with BioNanogenomics. This diagram shows some of the basic steps in optical mapping, although there are a lot of variations as I'll discuss. But the first thing you do is you have cells that you retrieve your DNA from. And then there, um, you utilize something, um, a microfluidic device, to essentially take single genomic DNA molecules, very large molecules, and stretch them out um, across these microfluidic chambers. You then fix them into place, and then restriction enzymes are added to cut the DNA molecules at specific positions. Um, specific for the restriction enzymes. You then stain them with a fluorescent dye and each molecule gives you a banding pattern um, showing where the cuts are. Um, when, they're, when the enzymes cut, the, the molecules retract a little bit from uh, each other and so you get little spaces. It's uh, very convenient. You can actually measure the length of each of each fragment 
and you end up essentially with something very much akin to a DNA fingerprint. You can then take these, these fingerprints that you get for these different molecules, single molecules, and you can align them and produce a consensus genomic optical map. Um, this is a, a very powerful technique um, and it's fairly new but I imagine that it will it uh, may very well replace a lot of the the old-fashioned back-based um, physical mapping. The company Opgen uses essentially exactly the same method that I just showed you. Um, here you see a, uh, a de single DNA molecules that have been stretched across these microfluidic channels. The DNA is immobilized and then it is treated with restriction enzymes which produce cuts as shown by the little red arrows there. So each DNA molecule is being cut into little fragments um, these fragments are then measured, um, and this can be done autom automatically. And then the maps uh, can be generated of, of overlapping molecules, and you can start comparing maps from different organisms and different individuals um, to identify variations such as inversions, deletions, and so on. BioNano has a slightly different approach. Um, they also isolate high molecular weight DNA, but then they take, um, they use it, uh, one of several different techniques to label different nucleotides within the genome. Um, they may use a, an enzyme that pre produces a nick at a particular part, place and then insert a fluorescent molecule at that site. Um, or something like that. They essentially then transfer this into their their microfluidic device. They separate the molecule the the molecules out, and then um, they do alignments based upon the overlapping signals that they have introduced, or the signals that they have introduced into the DNA. They align those, and they essentially get a a map very much like that seen with the restriction map. Um, produced by Opgen. Um, you can also do the comparisons and, and um, uh, look at for deletions and so on. And this is all done without necessarily knowing anything about the sequence um, that you're starting with. But if you're doing sequencing and you've got um, a large amount of sequence data uh, this physical mapping can be integrated with that very quickly um, to produce some, some very powerful results. As I mentioned, BioNano uses several different techniques um, for, for identifying specific nucleotides or specific sequences. One is that they use some enzymes that nick DNA at specific sequences and then they fill in the next with fluorescent nucleotides. They also use what they term other enzymatic processes to label specific sites in the genome. And they also may hybridize the DNA with sequence-specific small molecules. These are all propri proprietary techniques and I'm not exactly sure what they mean by any of them, but they are utilizing this right now as a commercial service. and. Um, as I said, we're, we're testing it out with some cotton to see if we can assemble the, um, the, the recently sequenced cotton genome to see if we can reassemble it and produce a physical map that's, that's comparable or better using the bio-nanogenomics bio approach. Um, the fourth physical mapping approach is fish-based physical mapping, um, which I also call cytomolecular mapping. The figure below shows a is from a paper that I published a long, long time ago. Um, essentially, the, the concept is that if you've got a molecular genetic map like you've seen in A, you can use that to to screen a, a back library and or 
some other sort of library and find some clones that contain the markers that you're interested in. You can then take these markers, as shown in step D, and you can hybridize these to chromosomes. You can label each one with a different fluorochrome, and you can essentially physically localize and visualize the location of each probe on the chromosome. You can then create a map, as shown in E, showing the location of the probes upon the chromosome. And I show in, in this diagram, um, the chromosome itself has got blue areas. That's, uh, those are heterochromatic regions. The white areas are, are, or I'm sorry, the blue is euchromatic regions. The white is heterochromatic regions. The little green circle is the centromere. So you can position these, these um, with respect to each other. And then, uh, if you've got a physical map, like the physical map, um, which is shown in, in step C there, you can then figure out the amount, number of base pairs between each of the um, fish markers that have been hybridized to the chromosome, and it gives you a concept of the compaction of the chromosome, and um, it gives you a much more realistic look at how DNA is located within the chromosome, how genes are located within the chromosome. Here's some uh, images of some fluorescence in situ hybridization that I did back when I was a graduate student. And essentially I was looking at tomato chromosomes and I was localizing single copy genes onto tomato chromosomes. Um, and this just shows an assortment of, of, of the chromosomes. And typically at the time I was just using one probe or as shown in, in frame I, um, maybe two probes at a time. Um, but now there's a lot more fluorochromes that you can utilize. This is, uh, here's a, a picture from a colleague, that a colleague of mine, Stephen Stack, my, he's actually my PhD advisor, let me borrow. Um, it essentially shows a, a complete set of tomato packeting chromosomes and uh, essentially in the tomato sequencing project, they identified regions that, that uh, were sequences that didn't fit into the assemblies. And what uh, Dr. Stack did was to take these sequences, find unique regions in them, and hybridize those to chromosomes. And they literally fell within gaps in the... Um, within the, the scaffolds, and so it helped to, to um, improve the, the genome sequence. Um, and these are just, you know, tomato has beautiful chromosomes, and you can see the, the kinetochore uh, as the bright staining kind of uh, circular area on each chromosome, and then the, the wonderful side of fluorescence there. Um, but this allowed them to one of the things that, that they did is they actually found that a lot of the molecular genetic map, mapping that was used to position scaffolds with regard to it, each other was just wrong, uh, especially in areas of heterochromatin. They could position things much more accurately using fluorescence in situ hybridization. Okay, so here's a figure from that, from that paper that I was talking about earlier. Um, where I showed all the different fluorescence in situ hybridization. Um, but essentially, it, it shows the localization of three different um, single copy sequences on tomato chromosome 11. So in, in image N, you can see there's a, a kind of a gold um, square or rectangle around uh, on the middle, that represents heterochromatin. The black dot represents the centromere. And then the locations of the three probes um, are, are graphed out on the, the long arm of the chromosome. Um, then in image O, you see just the mean location of each of, of, the, of the probes. And then if you compare this to P, which is the molecular linkage map, you see that on the molecular linkage map, the three markers are fairly equally spaced across the map. 
when in reality, based upon the, the cytomolecular mapping, these three markers are all located fairly close to each other in the, in the euchromatic region of, of the long arm of chromosome 11. Um, another important discovery that, that we made from this, this work was that on the molecular linkage map, the order of these markers is different from what we observed based on cytomolecular mapping. Um, if you look from left to right on, in figure O, um, you see blue, red, green is, is the order of the, of the markers. And if you look at the linkage map, it's red, blue, green. And um, one of the things that's been noted from the work on tomato um, is that the, the, the cytomolecular data is holding up much better than the, than the uh, molecular linkage-based organization of scaffolds. So we, in this paper back in 1999, we actually detected what does appear to be a, uh, a mistake in the molecular linkage map. Okay, in summary, physical mapping has been critical in the production of quality genome sequences. And because it's difficult, a lot of people are skipping physical mapping as part of their genome sequence. Ian and I understand that. Um, but sequences based on physical maps are still the gold standard. Um, one of the things that I would say, though, is that the sequences that are being produced simply based upon alignment of, of, of sequence reads, um, they're not going to be as accurate uh, as the old timey sequences based on physical maps. Um, but this new technology has allowed a lot more sequencing to be done and a lot more species to be, to be studied. One of the things that um, is of note is that the physical mapping part of the research has become less of a before sequencing tool and has transitioned more to an after sequencing tool. So a lot of people will publish their, their genome sequence, which is based primarily upon um, next generation sequencing and, and computational alignment of the reads. And then afterwards, when they really want to try to arrange things in a, in a proper manner, they maybe go back and do a, quite a bit of physical mapping to get the most accurate genome sequence. Um, however, until we can get to the point where we can sequence continuous megabase pieces of DNA, um, which, it, which when we get to that point, we can, you can do assembly of genomes very easily um, by yourself. Until we get to that point, we will continue to need physical mapping to help in the assembly of complex genomes, um, such as those of, of conifers and essentially all eukaryotes.